welcome. It's such an honor to be here today in celebration of Women's History Month. My name is Elise Marie Burkhofer, and it's an honor to serve as the global head of women's community and programs here at Google. And I am so honored to sit down and share this stage with this sister, Debbie Brown. Please round of applause for Debbie. <laughs> Debbie Brown is a master well-being educator and healer, advisor, storyteller, and founder of Debbie Brown Wellbeing. As the celebrated voice of the daily meditation on the Chopra app and host of the podcast Dropping Gems, her teachings have reached millions of people and counting. She serves as a well-being advisor for private high-impact clientele and for Fortune 500 companies. With teachings rooted in spiritual psychology, advanced meditation, metaphysics, energy healing, and trauma-informed facilitation, her mission is centered in the process of individual liberation that leads to community impact and an elevation of consciousness for all beings. Whew, powerful, powerful stuff. So your guided meditations have been downloaded over 10 million times globally, which is incredible to be a voice to anchor people into the present moment like that. And I would love for you to start us off just helping us all get present with a brief meditation. Ah, oh, that would be my pleasure. Can everyone hear me okay? Yeah, okay. How many daily meditators do we have in the room? Oh, amazing, awesome. How many have tried meditation once or more? Beautiful, okay, we'll be right at home. I wanna invite everyone where you're sitting to turn your body forward facing in the chair. You don't have to look at me in this moment. You'll just be able to listen to my voice. I want your back supported, so we're looking to have a nice straight spine and a soft belly. And take just a second here to see if you can get even more comfortable in your chair. So is there anything that might like to be uncrossed, a different placement for your feet? Notice your shoulders. And for those that haven't, I wanna invite everyone in this moment, as it feels safe, to let yourself gently close your eyes and begin to connect to the natural breath moving inside of your body. Just notice your own rhythm for a moment. And we're gonna do a sequence of four very simple breaths together. And when I prompt you to begin this breath, we're gonna take a deep inhale in through our noses for four seconds. We'll then hold that inhale at the top for four seconds. I'll keep the count. And then we'll have a slow measured exhale through our nose for four seconds. And then we'll hold it at the bottom. And we'll do that again a few times. Beginning here in this moment, I invite you to take a nice deep breath in through your nose. Two, three, four. Hold that breath. Two, three, four. Release that breath slowly. Two, three, four. Hold that breath at the bottom. Two, three, four. Beginning an inhale here in through your nose. Two, three, four. Hold it. Two, three, four, slow release, two, three, four, hold, two, three, four, beginning again, deep inhale, two, three, four, hold, two, three, four, release, two, three, four, hold, two, three, four, one last cycle together, in through your nose, three, four, hold it, 
three, four, release it. Three, four, hold at the bottom. Three, four, eyes still closed. Release your breath into a rhythm that feels natural and nourishing for your body. Our spines are strong. Our bellies are relaxed and open, soft. And we're gonna bring our awareness now to the very top of our heads, to the crown chakra, the space of visionary thought, expansive creative input, noticing yourself there right at your crown Gently let your awareness flow down to your forehead, the center of your brow, your third eye chakra. And as we are scanning down, let every area that your awareness touches bring forward a surrender, an opportunity to alleviate any tension in those spaces. Your awareness is now coming down the front of your face, You're relaxing your jaw, your tongue, moving down to your throat, your throat chakra, the space where you have the freedom to be fully expressed in your truth. Bringing that awareness down to your shoulders and letting them relax. And maybe moving your neck from side to side if that feels supportive and then coming down those shoulders right into your heart space in the middle of your chest. Bringing that awareness to the center of you where enlightened leadership, heart-led leadership resides. and bringing that awareness from your chest, slowly scanning down, and right underneath your rib cage, above your navel, is your solar plexus chakra. The center of our self-esteem, according to Vedic tradition, our core, where we are most empowered and most connected to our internal discipline, to our internal sense of self, to our ability to assert and command in the world, and sending some nourishment, some polishing in that space, and scanning down now right beneath your navel, your sacral chakra, your creativity center, often considered the area that's very well known for birthing other beings. But this area is also the place from which you birth your vision. The seat of your intuition resides here, those gut responses. When you know the aligned right choice to make and the aligned right time. And sending some love and gratitude to that space in your body now and then bringing your awareness around the back, right to the base of your spine, your root chakra, where you are anchored and grounded into the present moment. The thing that is keeping you tethered here for the work you are meant to do in the world. And letting that awareness continue to scan down and Noticing if you'd like to release your hips here. And moving down the tops of your thighs, releasing any areas that can be softer, that can melt a little into the present moment. Awareness flowing down to your knees, releasing in your joints, moving down your calves and your shins. Noticing your ankles, releasing any pressure there. Bringing your awareness all the way to the tips of your toes 
and the soles of your feet. And taking a deep inhale here. Releasing that breath. Feeling real gratitude for this body that has carried you throughout life to meet you in this moment. And anything that this body has survived, anything that this body has done, the way that it houses that tremendous spirit that lives inside of you. And in this moment, I'd like to introduce what is known in primordial sound meditation as the four soul questions. And as we bring these questions forward, we are not looking to fill the space with an answer. We can turn off that solutions mind that we have. We are stating a question to the great mystery and then we are allowing the answers to reveal themselves over time, over the rest of this day, over this next week. Who am I? Who am I? Breathing into that question and not filling that space with an assumption, with a perception, with an answer of any kind, just holding that container open. Who am I? and releasing that question and moving into what do I really want? What are those deeper desires in the core of your being? What do I really want? Letting your chest rise and fall, breathing into that answer. What do I really, really want? And releasing that question. What am I grateful for? What? am I grateful for? What am I grateful for in this life, in my personal history, in my expanded view of my future? What am I grateful for? and releasing that question and moving into our final soul question. The reason outside of what we do, outside of how people know us, the reason we're here as humans to be of service, to push humanity forward. How can I serve? How can I serve? How can I serve? And when I bring forward the question of service, it is deeply linked to the understanding of Dharma, which is a more expanded understanding of purpose. Dharma is the totality of who and what we are, our experiences, our remembrances, our deeper purpose and intention mixed with our unique gifts and the skills we've acquired 
surrendered to the greater understanding of how we are meant to use these in service. What is my dharma? And just hold here for a moment as you release that question and connect to the deep silence that is available to us in this moment to the feeling of energetic connection to every other person in this room and to every person that is connecting with us virtually. Allow yourself to really savor this silence here as you notice the relaxed state of your body and as you allow that nourishing breath to flow in and out of you in a way that is most supportive for your unique body and life. And let's take a big inhale here together in through our nose. And we can release it out with a sigh. Let's do that twice more. Big, full, deep inhale through your nose. And one last time together, deep inhale. Bringing your awareness back into the present moment, wiggling your fingertips and your toes. And if it feels aligned for you in this moment, as your eyes are still closed, I invite you to bring your hands to prayer position in the center of your chest. Really just in deep gratitude for this moment, this opportunity to breathe and be still and connect with that deepest, most radiant part of yourself that exists outside of your title, outside of your workflow, that little inner oven inside that stays warm just for you and your unique path. And you can bring your fingertips to forehead center as we take a gentle bow for one another. The light in me recognizes and honors the light in you. Allow yourself to gently open your eyes. Namaste. <sighs> How's everyone feeling? Yeah, good. Mm. Thank you. Beautiful, Thank beautiful. You. Thank you so much for anchoring us here. And <sighs> posing those questions and I'm so excited now to come from this grounded place and dig mm -hmm. into this conversation with you about cultivating wellness at work and in our lives more broadly. Yeah. yeah. So I'd love to start just hearing a little bit about your personal journey. You know, we're speaking of Dharma as a little girl, you know, were you always interested in well-being? You know, what were the pieces mm -hmm. you think in the early phase of your life that, that helped pave the way for you to be where you are today? Oh my gosh, so many things. <laughs> you know, that's the thing that I think I'm finding most beautiful about this moment of my life. And um, when you reach certain milestones in your age and in your professional life, you get a chance to kind of have that rear view look at mm -hmm. things where everything isn't holding as much charge anymore. And so you're looking at your life and your experiences with a little more neutrality. Um, for starters, I, I'm an L.A. girl, born and raised in L.A., um, and I'm an only child raised by a single parent who is also a latchkey kid. Mm. So that dynamic kind of brings with it a lot of living inside your own head and in your own heart and having a lot of hyper-independence, mm. which has its trauma. And then on the flip side of it has its superpower that mm -hmm. really allows you, allowed me to come into a space of deep observation of the world that I was mm -hmm. in really young. 
So I do remember I was that I was a young person who was really fascinated by transformation. Mm -hmm. There were things that adults would say around me that just didn't make sense. Things that were like, you know, people don't change or mm -hmm. a lot of just very harsh criticisms and observations of other people in the mm -hmm. world. And I just remember really young feeling like, but that doesn't make sense. Mm -hmm. If the planet is on this natural rhythm of always regenerating, mm -hmm. right? If we're having constant change in our cells and in every moment, mm -hmm. All change is possible. Mm -hmm. Everything can connect to a creativity that allows for more. Um, so that was, I think, my initial viewpoint, my first kind of connection to self-inquiry, where I was just observing everyone, especially the adults, and saying, okay, what makes sense and what really doesn't? Mm -hmm. You know, what, what am I hearing, but what is behavior actually showing up as? Mm -hmm. um, so astrologically, I'm a double Gemini. So for those that are into astrology, that says everything. Mm -hmm. It is always like, ch -ch -ch. but yeah, I was very addicted to transformation. Um, you know, the growing up in LA, and I had the opportunity and experience to live in a lot of different parts of Los Angeles, starting in Watts, and then eventually living all over, moving everywhere from like Venice to Century City, Alhambra, um, San Gabriel which are very specific cultural areas that have completely different dynamics. Mm -hmm. um, you got to, it really opened me to seeing the human condition, seeing the complexity, mm -hmm. seeing the layering of each of the experiences we were having and how different that was from the way that the mainstream world was telling us that everybody's life was. Mm -hmm. um, so that really planted the seeds in me just to be fascinated by growth within oneself and how that creates growth in the world. Mm, beautiful, beautiful. And speaking of growth and constant change and, and reinvention, you spent a while in an early part of your career in radio and TV, and I'm curious what role did that play in your professional journey? And obviously you've, you've shifted and evolved, you know, yeah. how did you know when it was time for, for mm. something new? Working in that industry was such a gift in so many ways. Um, one, the ability to get really concise in the way that you communicate, mm -hmm. the ability to really have a lot of training and using and projecting your voice, which at that time I had no idea I'd use mm -hmm. that to lead like global meditation. Mm -hmm. um, it was a perfect fit for me at the time because I am a deeply curious person. Mm -hmm. So being able to ask a lot of questions, connect with people from so many various walks of life, and try to come up with things that actually touched them, that felt compelling, that was more, um, for me, my role in that was, you know, I didn't wanna talk entertainment, and that's what eventually got me out of the mm -hmm. field. I didn't want to ask people really like, qu deep questions that weren't my business about things that ultimately aren't pushing anything forward, right? Mm -hmm. It's just for projection. It's just so we can see people and discuss them and mm -hmm. kind of avoid ourselves. That's how I began looking at a lot of the work that I was asked to do. And about 10 years ago, I had a chance to interview um, one of, I've interviewed him many, many times gratefully, but one of our early interviews, um, one of the great artists of our generation, uh, Kendrick Lamar. Mm -hmm. And we had this interview where before like the term mental health was really kind of in the world, we talked a lot about depression when his mm -hmm. album came out. And I believe that was to Pimp a Butterfly. And I was asking him questions about depression and we were talking about suicide ideation and a lot of things that people weren't speaking to at the time. Mm -hmm. And I remember in that moment, we get out of this interview and the program director said, you can't air this. Mm. We're not gonna release this. Like, no one cares about that. Why didn't you ask him, you know, who he's dating? Why didn't you ask mm. him, you know, if he has beef with anyone? You know, just like the kinds of questions that were going around at that time, you know, just such a lower frequency. And I said, huh, okay. And I, I put the interview out anyway. I wasn't allowed um, to air it on camera or to air it over the airwaves, but I decided to put it on the internet, right? And this is before that was kind of really happening in a big way. And that interview ended up going viral. And 
I started getting letters coming in, like actual physical written letters and emails from people all over saying that was the first time they heard someone they admired, speaking of Kendrick, talking about something with mm. such depth. Yeah. And that was the moment that I knew I can't stay here. Mm. You know, it's time to take all of these gifts and this ability and also, you know, um, all of the expertise I had amassed in doing that and have the conversations that I felt could actually impact people in a meaningful way. Mm. And then that mixed with, I, you know, I was at the time oscillating between going to concerts and red carpets and doing all these things, but then disappearing for weeks at a time to study, to be a meditation teacher and reading, you know, the Bhagavad Gita and just connecting with sacred texts and all that deeper work and mm -hmm. really beginning the foundation of what my personal philosophy and understanding around healing was. Mm -hmm. And I just felt the world needed that more than more conversations about entertainment. Mm -hmm. Wow. From me, at least. Yeah. yeah. What a powerful story. And I'm so glad you released that online and really trusted your gut mm -hmm. around knowing that conversation needs to be heard. I actually lost my own brother to suicide after a battle with depression. And from just that place of yeah, deep desire for us to destigmatize the conversations around mental health and the suffering that some of humanity is in, just Thank you. And I'm curious what, what more you think needs to happen for us to be more open around our mental health and, yeah. you know, just, yeah, support ourselves and each other. You know, we're in a really, we're in a really interesting moment because as with everything, there's the, there's the yin and the yang. There's the light and the shadow with everything, right? So this field, um, wellness, it's now really on our radar globally. Mm -hmm. I think for a long time, if you happen to live in LA, especially like in this area, Venice, Santa Monica, yeah, meditation, you see that everywhere, yoga. But I've also lived in areas that are deserts for mindfulness. Mm -hmm. I lived in Texas for several years and you know, really tried to teach meditation out there and, and was always kind of facing this narrative around that not being of God or mm. that being, you know, just something so silly. What does that really do? Mm. And um, to, see, to see the world change in the last several years as it has, mm. where that's not the response anymore, mm -hmm. pretty much wherever you are, is really incredible. But it's time to advance the conversation past just, let's diminish the stigma, mm -hmm. right? Like, yes, and... What else? Because it's not just about now all of us kind of trauma dumping on one another. Mm -hmm. That's an important piece, like understanding your story, having the courage to share it, seeing that commonality in all of us, yeah. that we all carry something. Mm -hmm. But then there's a point where we actually really have to be in practice mm -hmm. with the tools that we are looking to embody. And I think what I'm noticing right now, and this is not you know, a generalization, it's, this is a pocket of what's happening, but a lot, of, a lot of language is coming on board, right? Where some of the beauty of how equitable mindfulness and wellness and mental health is becoming, it's also creating a lane for bypassing and mm -hmm. also for a little bit of exploitation, yeah. especially around terminology. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of diagnosing going on. There is a lot of, you know, just staying in the cognitive functioning of saying, oh, okay, I'm in, I'm in cognitive therapy. I understand this has happened about my life and that. And that's a profound step and it's a massive liberation for each of us to have the courage to come into that space. And then there's more. Then it's actually about taking that information from this intellectual place in your brain and kind of taking an internal elevator down to the center of your chest where you start to live the changes you wanna see. Mm -hmm. We're not just standing behind the, this is what happened to me, or this is how I think, or this is why I am this way. It's I see that view, and what else? Mm -hmm. What do I want to become? What's more, what's possible? And it's bringing in those holistic practices that actually allow us um, 
to have more physical vitality in our bodies, to bring in more physical health into our lives, to really nourish our mental health, to say, hey, if I'm prone to anxiety or if I'm prone to a depression, these are the tools that I have to be committed and disciplined Mm -hmm. about initiating inside of myself and my life when I feel that moment coming. Mm -hmm. Um, So that's a part I'm really excited about. Mm -hmm. We're moving forward into what are the practices that support destigmatizing mental health. Yeah, Yeah, amazing. And I'd love to hear more because you've spent decades studying and practicing and and teaching um, some of these practices and tools. You know, what have been the most transformative practices in your own healing journey? What are the tools that you love to offer people? Yeah, ooh. There, I mean, I think that's a really exciting piece for me too because when I first started my journey, the landscape looks so different. Um, I was often the youngest person, the only person of color in a lot of the retreats I'd go to, yeah. even in a lot of the teacher trainings I've done. And I have a background in meditation and breath work and spiritual psychology um, and somatic experiencing. And there is a lot of different techniques and practices that I use and believe in. And often when I was learning, I'd come into those spaces and it would be in environments that weren't really safe for me Mm. um, and for my complex lived experience, but I was still able to glean the tools. And so I think, you know, for everyone, and so often meditation is taught really from more of the, the standpoint of the Zen, right? Like it's a lot, the way we've seen it in popular culture is really at the advanced technique. It's Mm -hmm. at the highest level of my mind is empty and I'm in peace and I'm in tranquility. And you know, it's a lot of the perfect postures Mm -hmm. which are powerful and everyone will get there. But only showcasing it in the advanced technique at the finish line, I think does a lot of us a disservice because it's hard for people to connect to a daily practice of meditation Mm -hmm. because you will face the triggers that come with that at first. So I think the master teacher, the master tool for mindfulness is a meditation practice or a breath work practice. Meditation does not always feel safe depending on your life thus far. So sometimes closing your eyes and being quiet is actually an incredibly emotional and triggering experience and that is okay. Mm -hmm. There are ways to get around that. It could be taking a slow walk with yourself. It could be a meditation where you do a low eye gaze. So it's kind of looking like this, where I'm just seeing blurred figures around me or a little bit of the floor, but it's keeping me in a feeling of safety while giving me access to that other view of myself. Um, but that, that process we did when we began our session today, I think we spent about 10 minutes in that. That 10 minutes, that five minutes, if done every single day, the, sci- the scientific backing on it is now proven and very clear. It does a lot for your brain health. It does an immense amount for your nervous system, for calming your system, for bringing you into your own awareness. That can be done in a couple of minutes throughout your entire day. If in a high charge moment um, or in a moment where you might be caught in a ruminating thought, it could be about work or it could be about something in your life, just being able to say, hold your own heart, one full breath cycle. Mm. When we see techniques like that, it's often thought, that can't work for me. You don't know what I'm going through. You don't know what my life has looked like. Mm. That is the master tool for so many um, regulations of our traumatic experiences, calming anxiety. It works and it works in the seconds. It does not have to be that more expansive practice, but starting there, it's the master teacher for everything else that you kind of want to bring into your life. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. Yeah. And I believe that this sense of being able to practice mindfulness and just have emotional intelligence, it's some of the core skills that we as humans need to exist in this world with the complexities and uncertainties and challenges that that we face. And so it sounds like meditation and breath work are two of the 
the greatest tools you'd say starting with, you know, what else do you recommend for folks that are looking to grow their practice of mindfulness, their ability to be more self-aware, regulate their emotions? Yes. I am a believer, um, my favorite thing to teach is self-mastery. Mm. It's moment by moment integrity and good choice making. Those are the structures that uphold every other change you wanna mm -hmm. see in your life. And so if we can master one thing, we can master anything. And so when I, when I come into environments like this, especially with some of my corporate clients or some of my C-suite clients, it's really, it can be really fun and expansive because a lot of you in this room are visionaries. You have a lot of heightened access to your creativity and your intuition in a way that other people don't. I'm sure, without even knowing what each person individually does, there are things connected to what you do that you are always locked into your gut response. You don't have to sit and you know deliberate around things to come into a solution or an understanding. There sometimes is that ch -ch 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 dashboard view in front of you. If you have a connection to something like that, that makes you just excellent at what you're doing when you're getting to a flow state with things that you want, you can use that same ability to work on anything internally you have ever wanted to express, investigate, or release. And so getting into a space where we're utilizing some of those really fine-trained tools that we excel in our purpose and excel, excel in business with, and giving that same level of specificity and intention to the ways that we want to see our internal view, it's, mm -hmm. it's, um, it's just such a gorgeous, masterful um, expander in our lives. Yeah, beautiful. I love that. And so as folks are working to develop those skills of self-mastery and, and being integrity in the moment, I'd love to bring that context into the workplace because, you yeah. know, most of us are, you know, are working. And I love that you've flipped this concept of work-life balance on its head and mm. talk more about life-work balance. Can you share, you know, how you view that and how yeah. folks can be bringing that into their life? <sighs> work-life balance. <laughs> You know, that is the saying that we've been hearing, you know, for maybe the last 15 years mm -hmm. or so, right? Like the, the, the saying that I feel has actually become a prison for a lot of us mm. um, because it really kind of oversimplifies some of the greatest complexities that we hold in our life. Like when we say the phrase work-life balance, we're also working through so many systems of oppression. Yeah. We're working through so much brainwashing, so much programming that's happened to us generationally and intergenerationally. And especially as we're speaking, you know, in, in this month where we're really highlighting women in the world, from the woman's view, you know, the generations that predate me, it was, you're only allowed to be this, you're allowed to be a martyr, you're allowed to be in service to a family system. And then it was, okay, you can work, but you gotta be excellent at work and give the same amount of attention to detail at home as if you were home only, right? So there was this idea going that you can have both. You can't. You can't have both always at the same time. Mm -hmm. You can have you. By that I mean, we are so much more than our titles. And so if we're looking to try to have this flourishing, harmonious home life with all the complexities that come with that, and we're looking to have this girl, boss, boss, babe, you know, life, however Instagram has been talking about it for the last, you know, decade or so, <laughs> But then we're also looking to be the most excellent at work underneath a certain title or a certain ability. That's not what having both is. Having both is connecting to the deeper centered mission and purpose of your life based on your experiences, your gifts and abilities. And then letting that permeate everything. It's connecting to that internal value system to what is my deeper need and desire with this one life that I get. And how can I allow that to inform the way I show up at home, 
the way I show up at work. Mm -hmm. And then it's this dance that we're always going to do because life is complex. Mm -hmm. None of this is easy for any of us. Mm -hmm. You know, I have a five-year-old, I'm working full-time, I'm traveling, and I'm managing, you know, to squeeze in an hour of meditation for my personal practice every day. Mm -hmm. That doesn't all, I'm not, I'm not gliding through my house like this, right? Mm -hmm. Like, but I am in each moment trying to make the most aligned choice possible for my unique makeup. Mm -hmm. I have become an expert at myself. I've become an expert at my personal history and at the value system that I want to live in. Mm -hmm. And I allow that to inform the way I move with my child, the way I move in my home life, my friendships, mm -hmm. my work. Um, so that, that to me is what the balance actually is. It's yeah. coming into the most aligned vision for how you want to feel about yourself and your life how you want to enact the purpose that is uniquely yours mm -hmm. and letting that knowing inform anything you do, whether it's working at this company or any company mm -hmm. or you know, being with your current partner or someone that may be destined for the future. Mm -hmm. It's all about your internal integrity. Yeah, I love that, holding that sense of that alignment of the vision and continuing to be in integrity as it evolves too. I have a few more questions for you, but I did want to start to invite if anyone has questions for Davi, you can uh, line up at the mic there and we'll get going with those in a moment. Um, I want to talk for a minute about your son, um, Quest, uh, who's almost five, and while not all uh, humans will choose to be parents, many do, and I'm curious just what the lessons and the gifts of oh. becoming a mother <laughs> um, have given you, how it supported your own evolution of consciousness, Mm, thank you for that question. It is always such an honor um, to speak about my son. Mm -hmm. <sighs> Parenthood is the most triggering experience you could ever have in your <laughs> entire life. It brings everything about your personal history forward into one moment at, in the highest stakes possible, right? Like the supporting the life of another being that you chose to bring here. You know, it's, motherhood is exquisite and it's really hard mm -hmm. and it's really complex. Mm -hmm. And when you wanna do it well, when you wanna shift things in a way that maybe generations that preceded you didn't get to because of so many things, because of so many systems of oppression, so much genera generational trauma, preferences, you know, all yeah. the things. Um, but when you kind of tap in to the acceptance and even having reverence for not just parenthood, but the intimate relations you choose to be in with others, that it is really this divine mirror, mm. it opens things up. When you take out some of the personal judgment of getting it right or wrong mm. and you just look to be planted in the present moment with curiosity mm. for yourself, for what this experience is, mm -hmm. I think that brings a lot of ease. None mm. of us are gonna be perfect at literally anything that we try, yeah. right? And especially when it comes to keeping, um, to guiding a little life. Mm -hmm. But for me personally, as a woman, as a mother, as a being, um, being a mom has unlocked not just this unconditional love that I feel so grateful I'm able to give to my son freely, mm -hmm. but it's unlocked an unconditional love inside of myself for myself that I never really knew mm -hmm. I'd be able to have access to in that way. Mm -hmm. um, and I think also, you know, when you have kids, if you let it, especially if you allow yourself to lean into your own intuition, for parenting mm -hmm. um, and check out resources that are different than maybe what you had as a young person. It unlocks so much play in your life, mm -hmm. so much creativity. You know, my personal generation and the one that is right above it, we were known as more the forgotten generation, right? So there's a lot of people that were latchkey kids. There's a lot of kids. I even think back to the movies that are around in my childhood. I was born in the mid 80s. The movies from my childhood we're about a lot of kids going through trauma and having to figure it out alone. Even the Disney films. I tried to rewatch The Lion King with my son this week. I was like, no. Why? I had to leave the, the theater for that. The daddy and yeah. like, 
And then he's taking the blame and all the guilt for his murdered father and like no one's telling the truth. And mm. I was just like, okay, I don't mm-hmm. want to, I don't know. Um, <laughs> but when I really looked at that, it's like it also has one of the best soundtracks ever. It's an incredible on stage, you know, but really look at that. That's our foundation. Our foundation was trying to figure it out by ourselves with adults that were either absent or ill-equipped. Yeah. I'm really passionate about for each of us when we are on this road of self-discovery, looking at all the barriers Mm -hmm. that are in place that we hold against ourselves and really questioning them. Mm -hmm. Because that, in some ways, it's kind of funny to see that theme that was woven through our childhoods of like, oh, wow. You know, now I, for those that are parents, now there are shows like Bluey or like these really amazing shows for kids, Stillwater, that are teaching life lessons. But what did that actually do to our psyches? What did that do to us in the foundational moments of our lives as our sense of self and our emotional regulation was being formed? You know, what are the ways that we've been influenced that we can really investigate and cast aside and allow ourselves to evolve our understanding of self around? Yeah. Mm. So deep. I hope that answered the question. (laughs) Absolutely. Yes. Our kids being that mirror and the invitation into presence and trusting your intuition. I love, I love all those points so much. And you mentioned unconditional love and you mentioned finding and, and breaking down the barriers. And I'd love to just go deeper on what you see as the, some of the easiest ways we can break down the barriers for unconditional love for ourselves, for others, because I feel it's something we're all, we're all still working to cultivate and I think is one of the the greatest keys. Mm. 100%. So this is a lifelong work, right? Mm -hmm. Like the journey of self, it's a lifelong thing. It doesn't happen in a weekend of vision boarding. That sets mm-hmm. the intention for things that we want and desire and ways we want to change. But when we are committed to work in mental health, to work of well-being within ourselves, within our families, within our communities, it's about really saying this is going to be your life's work. Mm-hmm. You know, not saying how how do I get how do I figure myself out in the next month because I want to get that promotion and I want to have this relationship and I want to do this. And it's saying, you know, this is, this is a core wound. I may have been investigating for a while. Let me take the year on it. Let me give myself the year Mm -hmm. to just be in flow and in practice with this. Um, I think giving ourselves the opportunity to investigate without judgment, When we have that harsh inner critic, when we have that voice internally that is looking to criticize us or demand perfection, just taking a breath and saying, why am I so angry at myself? What have I done so wrong that I have to have this tone with me? Some of those investigative questions, those curiosities, It adds so much value to our lives and the way that we're able to be with ourselves. You're in this vessel the whole time you're here. Mm -hmm. You gotta love it. You gotta find a way to accept it. We all have very complex lives and I'm certain that each of us holds at minimum one, maybe at maximum hundreds of stories that no one else will ever know. Mm -hmm. So many experiences that people won't be able to easily digest as they're perceiving you. So how do we come into a space where we can say, can I accept that a little bit more? That's really it. That's what shifts it. Self-care, mental health, none of it is sustainable Mm -hmm. unless we switch our view of self-judgment and Mm self-criticism to curiosity and acceptance. So powerful, the curiosity, the acceptance piece, yeah, when we inevitably come up against those pieces of judgment Mm. and criticism. Thank you, thank you. I'd love to hear from some folks in the room. What questions do you have for Devi? This incredible, incredible woman. And they can be technical too. If there's any questions about a daily practice, if you're looking to like, what are some supportive techniques or anything like that? I love that. Use the microphone so we can hear you. Thank you. Awesome. 
Um, hi, my name is Kayo. First of all, thank you so much for talking with us. I am obsessed with your podcast. I <laughs> listen to it so often. And one of the questions that you posed earlier, um, I'm not sure what session it was, was the question of who are you being called to become? Mm. And that has really been one of my like guiding questions ah. for this year. So first of all, I just want to say that. Um, thank you. And I think the um, analogy you made just now to like Disney movies and how we grew up, having to kind of understand that we're going through this growth journey alone and the, um, the fact that that's kind of a negative experience to have. I was thinking about that kind of juxtaposed with the fact that you, you do have to go through a lot of this um, coming and awareness of self journey alone. So I guess I'm trying to understand like how do you, under, how do you define that balance of better supporting people as they go through this growth journey through life, especially people that we're bringing up under us with also the, no the knowledge that a lot of this life journey is very individual, so. Yeah, yeah, thank you, thank you. first for all of the beautiful words and thank you for this question. That is the balance that we're really looking to understand. It's not the work-life balance, it's the self-care, internal healing, self-mastery journey mixed with what am I focusing internally, digesting and embodying, which is what we have to take our time in, which is why I always stress it is not the one retreat that you go to once a year, and it is not the vision board weekend alone. It is everything that you're choosing to support those intentions with on a moment by moment choice making basis. From there, you're able to see what can I give out? What we sometimes do that is very misaligned and harmful for each of us and just utterly exhausting is we're looking to caretake for everyone else and then hold this very stoic, rigid belief about how much care we're not allowed for ourselves. And it, you know, the most simple saying we've all heard, right? You can't fill from an empty cup. Foundationally, your street, you have to patch your potholes first. Right? Like you have to make sure that the street that you are on, the foundation set, it's firm, it's nourishing, it's supportive. From there, everything is a build up, right? You're not looking to fill a void and from the void erect, the foundation is secure and then the buildings come, then everything else that you want to bring comes. So it's that mix of both. Show up for people, show up for your community. We must, in all the ways that we can, we must. But you have to have internal practice at home. That's the piece that I think has been missing. That is the piece that has been especially miss missing for bodies of culture and also for women since the inception of human history, since the inception of America. You know, it's always been more about selflessly give be overly responsible and overly give, but no one was talking about how do you meet your own needs too? How do you make sure that you're getting enough rest at night, that you're able to have practices that allow your brain to turn off? Th that has to be the focus. Once you're full, there is so much ease in the way that you will be wielded to move in the world. There is so much instant direction on how you're meant to then turn that into something that can be of service to your family, to a group of people, your community, to a friend in their time of need. But you have to do the peace with you first. That's also the dynamic of like the, you know, the friends that give a lot of advice they don't take, <laughs> right? Like living in theory, all of it is theory until we put it into practice for ourselves. So we have to take our own advice. We have to build the case study inside of ourselves before we begin to share it and teach it with others in an authentic way. Mm. Amazing. I got another question in the room. Thank you. Hi, thank you. Uh, my name is Marav, and um, I consider myself a recovering people pleaser as part <laughs> of this work. And as someone who's been working on herself and really diving into some somatic embodiment type of work, I'm starting to peek into more spiritual areas. I'm starting to notice a lot of areas where I can, where I really want to bring in my community. Mm. Do you have any advice or any tips 
especially for folks who are really skeptical or really critical of this type of work and this type of world, mm -hmm. in being of service rather than pouring out of an empty cup, mm -hmm. being of service from a full cup, how can I bring my community in on this amazing journey with me? Mm -hmm. Thank, Thank you. you for that question and intention. You know, that's, um, that's the part where we get into some of the crevices of ourselves when we are called to share it with others and we hit that rigid wall. Um, you know, the thing that I think is really important to know, especially when we come into our own tools and practices, we're never taking the position of convincing, right? Like even there, I remember early when I was teaching uh, meditation, I'd come into rooms and if I had an hour, I'd have to spend 45 minutes convincing people meditation was not of the devil. Mm. Like literally, like I had this whole kind of surgical way that I know I'd, had, I'd have to disarm people before I could even get them to close their eyes and take a deep breath. Mm. So what I've really come to find is none of us are here to convince. So if we find ourselves speaking in a way that's trying to get someone to turn to do it, release it. That in and of itself is a manipulation. That in and of itself is us feeding something that we all do hold, this deeper inner people pleaser that we all come in it at different degrees. I'm a reformed people pleaser as well. I respect the journey. Um, but that's the piece that we'll notice gets triggered when we want to share things that are really important to us. There's a piece of us that'll get offended because we know what it does for us. And when people reject it, that feels like even more of a rejection or how do I find more ways to explain it so you get it or uh, we're not convincing. Mm -hmm. Your lived experience is the teacher. Those that are ready will come, mm -hmm. you know, and teach to those that are ready and then just expose to those that aren't. People are watching, having that, that inner radiance, that peace, that ability to be emotionally regulated, to have a centering of being in your body. Even the person that is most against it, even if it takes them 10 years or never, they're watching, that is a healing for them. Mm -hmm. So just let that do what it's meant to do on a subconscious level. And when people are ready, when people want to know more, when people are open, that's where you invest your time. And then we let the ripple effect happen. You know, the, um, that saying, um, you know, like you may be called to plant the seed, right? But we're not always called to like water and, you know, plow and then harvest. Sometimes it's just, I'm just meant to be the seed that goes in the ground, and then I detach. I don't choose when it peaks up. I don't choose when it blooms. Mm -hmm. I'm not called to also hold the watering pot over it. Mm -hmm. I'm just called to drop the seed. Um, so figuring mm -hmm. out for each of us in our lives where we are in that kind of farming process, how we're meant to be used. Mm -hmm. Thank you. All right, well, it has been such an honor, Debbie, to be in conversation with you. As we wrap up and close for today, I'd love to ask just if there's a mantra right now that you're living by that's resonating with you that you'd like to leave with this room, everyone on live stream and on YouTube. Oh, thank you so much for having me. It has been such, such a privilege to be in conversation with you today and just all the work that you are bringing forward in the world. I just see you and I commend you and it's so powerful. Thank you. Thank you. I think for that mantra, I would love to actually lean into what you shared. That, that mantra, that inquiry, I came up with at the very beginning of the pandemic. It was the first couple of weeks of the pandemic. And none of us at that time, like I remember here in LA, it was like, all right, it's just for two weeks. We'll be in the house for two weeks. And you know, and you're like, two weeks? What do I do for two weeks, right? And you're like, oh, two years later. Um, <laughs> but I remember I didn't know what was coming. I didn't know what was gonna happen. Um, at that time, I, I, my son, I don't think was even two yet. And I remember I devised something for the community that I was working with. I ended up starting a women's group of 1,200 women in the first month of the pandemic. Outside of the other work that I did, this was just a free thing that I said online, I'll teach you how to meditate, I'll teach you how to have some practices, mm. let's go. Um, 
And I was called to call it the divine timeout, mm. which is so interesting to me now because, of course, I had no idea. I had no idea what a global pandemic would be and the way mental health would emerge, the way self-care would emerge, this whole, all of these paradigm shifts that would begin to happen for so many of us. Um, and I remember the first question that I set when I created, I created this, um, 19 day self-care meditation practice. And the first question that came to me was, how will you use this time? Who are you being called to become? That question is still so important right now because we have been directed this entire last year to find our new normal. There is none. And if we're going back to who we were and the way we thought of life prior to being on that divine timeout for a couple of years, we're doing ourselves and everyone a massive disservice. We should be changed. Mm -hmm. We should not be the same. We should not be looking to have the same flow in our social lives. We shouldn't know all the same people that we went into the pandemic with. We shouldn't have the same views um, and perspectives on things prior to the pandemic. So that's, that's the question to ask every day in each moment. Who am I being called to become? Mm. And then questioning ourselves, um, I'll share this one last piece. When we first came out of the two years of the pandemic, um, I spent the last three years working with one of my spiritual mentors, Deepak Chopra, working for Chopra Global. Um, and so we took two years off of our incredible global retreats that we would throw in different places around the world, different spiritual um, advanced meditation retreats. And the first retreat back after a two year pandemic was a six day silent retreat in Yosemite, mm -hmm. in the mountains, 400 people. Deepak and I led this retreat. And I remember everyone that worked for the company, we were all so excited to be back with people. And I remember everyone kept saying, oh my God, like this retreat is gonna be so da da da. And I said, I don't think so. Mm. I think we're gonna meet a lot of grief. Mm. I think 400 people coming out of two years of lockdown in the mountains, in nature, with all this elemental energy to meditate all day for six days and not talk we're gonna release. There's a lot that needs to flow out. Um, and that's exactly what it turned into. It turned into a profoundly beautiful opportunity to release a lifetime of grief for a lot of people in those woods. And I remember one of the teachers that was teaching there, um, one of the leaders of the meditation shared two questions that I think about all the time. And he said, everything you encounter in your life now, now that you're going into the world, growing into more of who you are, always ask yourself these two questions. Is this a nourishing choice? Is this an evolutionary choice? Those two questions, along with who am I being called to become in this moment? Who am I being called to become at work? Who am I being called to become at home? We're asking ourselves these questions in every facet of how we show up in the world. Mm. It's not just this idealized view of like, yeah, who am I? What's my elevator pitch for who I am, <laughs> right? Like we're so used to doing that because mm. we've been trained to on social media for the last 10 years. Mm -hmm. But no, fundamentally, in every role that you play, and then in the greater role that we're playing with our souls, who are you being called to become? Is this choice I'm making evolutionary? Is this choice I'm making nourishing? Sitting in those will be a really great um, steering wheel, internal GPS system for any of the ways that your life will be unfolding. Mm -hmm. So powerful. Thank you so much, Davi, for all your wisdom. Thank you.
We were so honored to have you here at Google. Thank you, everyone, for tuning in. If you're here in the room, we hope you'll stay for lunch, talk about what resonated for you, ask more questions. Thank you all for being here. Let's give another round of applause to Debbie. Thank you.